Welcome to Conversations on the Coast, San Francisco's premier author interview program. And today we have, as our guest, one of my favorite authors, and I am proud to say one of my friends, Sister Helen Prejean, is back. Welcome. Thanks, Jim. Great to be here. She's here pushing the paperback edition of The Death of Innocence, an eyewitness account of wrongful executions. It's now in paperback, as I said, from the wonderful folks at Vintage Books. Yes. And we're going to do some work for Vintage Books in the first segment, and maybe in the second segment, we'll get into what everybody in the Bay Area is talking about today. Unless you've forgotten, the New York Times book review said of the death of innocence, luminous, undecorated, angry, and very moving. It tests our conception of human decency. And it sure does. And the reason it does is what the book is all about, an eyewitness account of wrongful executions. One of the people, Dobie Gillis Williams, an indigent who uh, you visited for eight years. He's accused of murdering a woman in her bathroom. And his whole trial lasted one week. An African-American man with an IQ of 65. Right. Who always protested his innocence. Death row he was for 14 years. And contracted rheumatoid arthritis. It's one. I mean, his spirit, though, is just... You know why I wrote the book, Jim? Why? After Dobie's executed, after he's railroaded in, when you read his trial, you want to weep. Yeah. Uh, and all the things that where his constitutional rights were not protected. But after the funeral, we're standing in his mama's trailer in the kitchen. And she says to me, Sister Helen, nobody ever heard Dobie's voice. The prosecutor uh, talked to the news media, but they never came to us. And we didn't hear his voice at trial. Never heard his voice. You got to be his voice. So, Sister Helen, will you tell Dobie's story? And that's how this book was born. Part of the story you tell is is the very end. You write from the gurney. He turns and lifts his head to look for me. I'm on my feet, reaching my hand to him, holding the cross around my neck toward him for him to see. Warden Kane is holding his hand, talking to him. Warden Kane looks up to the executioner behind the one-way glass and nods his head, and I know that the killing process is beginning. Immediately, Dobie's eyelids start closing, and now I just want it to be over for him. I entrust him into God's merciful arms, one more black man executed by the state of Louisiana for a crime against a white victim. Dobie is dying. His head lifts involuntarily from the gurney, and Warden Kane puts his hand on his forehead and pushes his head back down. It must be the potassium chloride causing his heart to go into cardiac arrest. Dobie is being killed in front of my eyes. I know he's not suffering anymore. He handled his fear. He walked to his death, maintaining his integrity. Into your hands, O God, I commend Dobie Gillis Williams. And this is in 1999. (sighs) You know, and here we've had the death penalty for 30 years. You'd think we'd be, in quotes, getting better at it. The system's so flawed, and, and, you know, and, and so innocent people are going in along with the guilty. When the reader who reads Death of Innocence goes through this book, they are going to have more information than the jury ever had that condemned about them to that, death. About the, well, well, and just about everything. They don't get the truth because yeah. poor people are selected for the death penalty and they get poor defense. And if you don't have an adversarial system of coming to truth, a prosecution versus defense, you don't get to the truth. There ain't no truth that way. I mean, that's why we got 122 wrongfully convicted people yeah. Yeah. walking this. And they were saved by college volunteers. Northwestern University. Is one of them, but there yeah. are 40 of them now around the are country. There? College kids going in and doing the investigation. Woo-hoo. And it all keeps pointing to they didn't have defense, so they didn't have investigation. They didn't have independent forensic testing. And you also have prosecutors and the state that owns the evidence that holds it and doesn't have to turn it over if they don't want to. And the state crime labs, all of that is part of the system. You know, we in Dead Man Walking, I brought people with me into the crunch. When somebody's guilty, they did a terrible crime, should we kill them? And what happens to the victims' families? In this now, we we up the ante 
because we say we're not even doing it right no. and the way this thing is structured we're going to keep on making mistakes so it's not worth it let's hang the whole thing up joseph odell thought so little of the uh lawyer that they sent him he decided to defend himself you know why he he overheard how the defense attorney appointed to him of course he had no choice he was poor he had to take who was appointed to him was in cahoots with the prosecutor giving him all the information he said i'd rather defend myself and he didn't know how to file a motion he didn't know how to question witnesses on the stand and so when the jailhouse snitch stood up steve watson and pointed to joe and said you confess to me in your cell that you killed helen shartner and he stood up and said that's a lie he had no way to counter that and you know as i wrote this book it took me four years and part of the reason i think for the four years was steve watson called me and said i lied and they killed joe odell We've had a jailhouse snitch in the news right here in San Francisco lately, and we're going to talk about that when we return. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. Sister Helen Prejohn is the guest of the book, the paperback edition of The Death of Innocence, an eyewitness account of wrongful executions. Sister told me always to read that subtitle. is very, very important. And it's published in paperback now by Vintage Books. And I want to go to page 108 because I think there's something there that might be a segue into what's been going on around here in the Bay Area in the last couple of days. Uh, the title of his book says it all, Death at midnight, the confessions of an executioner. He did not pull the switch himself, but he knew he was an active participant in the killings. At the time, he justified his actions, he says, telling himself that he was just doing my job. But deep in his soul, he knew he was doing something terribly wrong. And after killing two men, he couldn't do it anymore and quit his job at war- as warden. And this sense of consciousness and conscience that that little quote uh, bespeaks is, I think, in a sense, what's going on, or, you know, yeah, around and here. That's Don Cabana in Mississippi that you were reading about. Yeah, conscience. Yeah. When does conscience finally get in? Well, we had uh, two doctors who immediately saw an ethical dilemma, a very clear and, and simple one, to do what they are being asked to do with respect to Morales uh, would be against the Hippocratic Oath. And they wouldn't do it, so he didn't get executed. Yes, because, you know, you have here, in the struggle of the state and the government to try to make death humane, you have a moving from hanging to the electric chair to lethal injection. Yeah. All right? Yeah. Yeah. Lethal injection is supposed to look like you're just going to sleep. And there are three drugs that they administer. And one, and the problem, why these doctors were summoned to administer the sleeping, the barbiturate that was longer acting, Mm -hmm. uh, was because a problem is being faced in the whole lethal injection in the cocktail. The first one is the barbiturate. The second one is potassium bromide. The third one is potassium chloride. Potassium chloride throws you into cardiac arrest. Okay. But solely to mask the death. They don't want witnesses seeing people as they writhe when they go into cardiac arrest. Potassium bromide paralyzes every muscle in their body. They can't open their eyelids. They can't cry out. Mm -hmm. They can't lift a finger. They've had hearings where veterinarians are testifying of why they don't use that anymore when they euthanize animals because you can't see when they're in distress. That led then to, we need to have a longer acting barbiturate. So they summon the doctors. So it's got to be administered directly. The doctors Uh, say, I'm not doing that. That's the fascinating thing. The judge said, that this has to be administered directly by injection into a vein. Right. Which which means that somebody has to go into the chamber and do it. Right. And dumb Jim didn't realize that up here at San Quentin, nobody's in that chamber. They're all behind the wall or in another room, and they're pushing buttons. Yes, and what the states have done, like Louisiana and all the states that lethally inject, Texas, over 300 people, they have technicians 
So they get advice from healthcare people somewhere in there, but they're unseen. But this was directly a doctor right. killing people. And so good for the doctors, I say. Now, the reason the doctor is there is because a judge said he had to be there. A medical doctor had to do the injection. Now, the doctor refuses to do the injection. The San Quentin folks apparently scoured the state or somehow and couldn't find anybody to do it. Yeah. So right. now it's over. There's nothing we can do last night to Mr. Morales. And there is now a, a kind of instant moratorium. Yeah. Which some of the legislators want to make a permanent moratorium in the sense of several months or something. And let's look at the whole darn process and see if there's any way lethal injection would not be cruel and unusual. And if the answer to that is there is no way, are we getting closer to getting rid of this penalty? Yeah, because you know what? It's a human process, and there's no way you can completely mask death sooner or later. you got to face it. You're killing someone. And why don't the people of California look? The, what I show in Death of Innocence is it's the southern states that are really serious. We do yeah, over 80% yeah. of the executions. Yeah. California isn't really that serious about executing people. Why don't you hang the whole thing up? Save the millions of dollars that you have for the death process and be a state for life. Wow. That would really be terrific. It would. That would really, I really mean, be I mean, and it's terrific. not like that money is just neutral. The millions and millions of dollars. Think what you could do to work with at-risk kids, to help kids that have problems with drugs. Yeah, yeah. It's very you know, costly. One of, one of the things that I'm wondering about as we talk about uh, uh, Mr. Morales is whether this, uh, what I call California crisis over administering the death penalty if it has any national implications. And Sister Helen Prejean is going to give us the answer when we come back. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at JimFosterCoc or send an email to JimFosterCoc at gmail.com. This is Jim Foster. It is Conversations on the Coast. The guest, Sister Helen Prejean, the book, The Death of Innocence, an eyewitness account of wrongful executions, about which one of the clearest thinking or at least clearest writing lawyers I know, Jeffrey Tubin, said this. Once again, Sister Helen Prejean has brought her fierce intelligence, critical eye, and moral passion to the subject of the death penalty. The Death of Innocence is also a detective story about the flawed ways of justice in America. Sister Helen's voice has never been more pained, more insistent, or more worthy of our attention. He's a good guy. Oh. He's a good guy. After hearing that, I'd like to read that book myself. <laughs> well, I read it very well, too. Yeah. You know? <laughs> we can't get into All right. that. If we can say that what's going on with respect to administering the death penalty in California is a crisis, is this a crisis that'll have legs around the country? It plays a part of the whole kaleidoscope of what's going on. Since 2001, death sentences have been cut in half in the United States. And it's because all the stories of the wrongfully convicted people were getting on the nightly news. And somebody had been on death row 17 years, made a mistake. See, it used to be the assumption in this country that if you had your day in court, if you were found guilty, if you received the death sentence, in case a mistake was made, there was always the appeals courts. Mm -hmm. And as mm -hmm. I show in Death of Innocence in the second part when I yeah, get into the yeah. courts, yeah, get and we want court. to talk yeah. about Justice Scalia. I got I to gotta <laughs> talk about Justice Scalia in the Supreme Court. He's your brother's hunting Hunt, buddy. Yeah. Louis and, and Scalia get along, and you and Scalia don't. I mean, that, And I got to say, that's just life. since we're on the duck hunting aside, <laughs> that Louis did hunt with Cheney once. Oh, no. And I'm glad I still have my little brother. Other, I have to say that. Without, without buckshot. Well, we got to talk about the courts because yes, there's please. a mentality in the courts. And what I found out in this is once a mistake is made, what happens in the appeals courts, they don't reopen the cases. They rely 
almost exclusively on procedures, timing, when you can file it. Did your lawyer, you say, my lawyer was completely ineffective. He didn't do anything for me. He didn't conduct any. Well, sorry, not ineffective, not perfect, but not ineffective. And what has happened in, during the Rehnquist Court over the last 20 years, they took each of the constitutional protections for uh, death row inmates and they they stripped them of each. They disenfranchised them. Correct. They made it impossible Correct. to prove ineffectiveness at counsel. Dobie, Gillis Williams, African-American, had an all-white jury. No court found that that was a, a unfair or impartial jury. Huh. I mean, they, they have made it impossible to prove these things. So what's happened is that's impacted the consciousness of America. And so the, the, we are beginning to get death sentences less. Another reason is it used what to be What you're saying juries, is, that the, is, is, is that the juries are not doing it. it. And another reason that's contributing to that, juries now who are asked to play God, yeah. now you decide, does this person live or die? Yeah. When they would ask, if we don't give this person a death sentence, what will their sentence be? Will they get out on parole? They weren't given an answer. So what would they do? They have to protect society. But now, like even Texas, Harris County, the buckle of the death penalty belt in Houston that's been responsible for more people on death row than anywhere. You know what they had last year? Two death sentences. In one year, they could have as many as 200 capital cases. That shows, this is very interesting what's happening. In practice, we're shutting it down. But now what California I think it represents. Shows, I think it shows that George W. Bush is president and not governor. No, I'm sorry. That's not yeah. true. Yeah. No. Oh, <laughs> it is gosh, the... I hardly know how to comment on that. I take him on full tilt in this yeah, book over Carla Faye Tucker and 152 yeah. executions with his buddy, Alberta Gonzalez, where he said he looked into every case. And then you find out morning of the execution, 15 minute exercise, checkbox, 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 152 times. That's George W. Bush. And that's Alberta Gonzalez now, the attorney general, who also said the Geneva Convention's were quaint and it's OK to torture suspected terrorists a little bit. But that shows what state we're in. And the only thing I know to do, Jim, is to wake up the people. Because people have to know what's going on. And this isn't just about the death penalty. This is about the Constitution of the United States and who we are as a country. And is violence the only thing we know to try to solve our social problems? That's what we have to look at. Yeah, yeah. And, and how hard the problem is came home to me when I was reading about uh, Justice Blackman, who who said that the death penalty could never be made constitutional. And he believed in it. For 20 years, yeah. he tried to make yeah. it work. And then finally, and you know, when you look at the practice, here we are 30 years later, we've done over a thousand executions. 87% of all those people who've been executed kill white people. And people of color are 50% of all homicides. So it clearly shows a requirement to be able to get the death penalty is did you kill a white person or not? And when people of color are killed, it doesn't seem to register. We have a new chief justice now. We have another justice who's just gone on the court. It's going to be tough. More yelling needs to be done. If you want to learn how to yell and read a great book, get The Death of Innocence, an eyewitness account of wrongful executions. We've been talking to the author, Sister Helen Prejean. This is Conversations on the Coast, and I'm Jim Foster. Follow us on Twitter at Jim Foster COC, or send an email to Jim Foster COC at gmail.com.